Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. When I grew up, I lived in a cabin in the middle of the woods in Alaska. Back in the 1970s, when I was a kid, it was like living feral. We had an outhouse, and I remember at a very young age having electricity put into the place for the first time. My parents were simple people, and I was one of seven kids. I was child number five and the loner of the bunch. While my siblings were content to go on all sorts of adventures in the woods and otherwise, with my parents or each other, I felt much more comfortable in the woods alone. I have since made my living as a writer and author, and I guess the making up of strange and oftentimes dystopian worlds and societies started in those woods that surrounded my house when I was little. My parents still live in that house, and I don't live too far away from them. But nowadays, a lot of the land they owned, they've since sold off, and the place just isn't the same. Not to mention how modernized the house is now. When I was growing up, I had many strange experiences with many things that I still, to this day, can't explain. But one of the strangest and the first was the one I'm about to tell you all about now. I always knew that Bigfoot existed because even back then, there were rumors of the beast among the adults around me. I heard them talking and thought for sure if I hung out in the woods for long enough, I could prove its existence one way or another. My quest started at 13 and it would take two long years of hanging out in those woods, which I would have been doing otherwise anyway, for me to find what I was looking for. Needless to say, though, I greatly underestimated what I was dealing with and never captured proof for anyone but myself. The day it happened is one I will never forget. I've since seen Bigfoot in those woods about a handful of times, but that first time was by far the strangest, and it's a memory that sticks out, not only because of how odd it all was, but also because I know what catching sight of one means, especially nowadays. I packed myself lunch and grabbed some buckets. I was going to try and catch some worms for fishing. I had a tree out there that I built a little treehouse which wasn't much of a house really, using sticks and larger pieces of wood that I found. The tree house was quite high, and it overlooked the shore if you walked through the wood. You would eventually get to. I never expected I would see Bigfoot anywhere other than directly inside of the wood too, but that was another shocker. I was digging for worms, and I was close enough to the little beach that I could hear the waves crashing onto the shore. But it was still a long way away from where I was at this point. Everything was normal, until I felt like there was someone standing behind me, and I started to smell a horrible stench. I looked around a bit, but didn't see anyone or anything. I really felt like something was behind me and watching me, but for the life of me, I saw nothing at all. While looking around to see the reason why I was no longer alone in the forest, I noticed something odd as well. I noticed that the entire forest seemed to have gone silent. I don't remember noticing exactly when it actually happened, but I noticed it when I felt another presence there with me. It was really creepy, and the hair on the back of my neck and on my arms was standing straight up on end. 
I considered running back home, but I hadn't caught that many worms yet, and something inside of me told me that then was my chance to see something out of the ordinary. Remember, for two years up until that point, I had been trying to obtain evidence that Bigfoot existed. I stood up and walked over to a nearby giant tree that had been downed and sat on the stump. I just waited, watched, and listened. There was still total silence, and I still felt like I wasn't alone out there anymore. I tried to pretend like I didn't notice. Something was wrong or amiss and just started looking at the ground, like I was about to go back to digging for worms at any moment. I saw the grass moving to the right of me, even though there wasn't any breeze that day at all, and from where I was sitting, I couldn't see anything there that would be parting it in the way that it was. It looked like something large was walking through it all, but again, there was nothing there at all. I was scared and my heart started pounding because it was at that point I knew for a fact that I wasn't alone out there. However, my mind couldn't make sense of what my eyes were seeing or of what it clearly knew at that point that something invisible was there. Suddenly, the birds were chirping again. Nothing seemed to be moving around anymore, and the feeling of being watched or of not being alone, went away altogether. Once again, I thought that I should just go home, but I was a precocious and curious teenager, and I wasn't about to just let it go. I needed to figure out what I was dealing with. I heard a really loud whooping noise. It sounded like something hollering, and it almost sounded human. Once I heard the first sounds, which were coming from the direction of the shore, I heard the same noises echoing across the forest and through the trees, coming from all over the place. Whatever it was, there were several of them, and they were communicating with one another. I ran over to my treehouse and climbed it. I was as high as I could possibly go and looked all around. I didn't see anything until I looked over at the beach. I couldn't believe my eyes as I watched a gigantic beast down there as it looked around at first. It almost looked like it was making sure it wasn't being seen. It kept turning quickly from one side to the other before it would bend down and pull something out of the water and bring it to its mouth. It was either grabbing small fish, crabs, or clams. I couldn't be sure, but I watched in shock and sheer amazement at the sight. It had to have been about 12 feet tall and maybe 5 or 6 feet wide. I could see it very clearly from my vantage point, but it hadn't yet spotted me. I didn't think it would have been able to see me from where it was, as I was really far away, and so I boldly just stood there, without trying at all to conceal myself, watching this fantastic creature grab its food from the water. It was covered in brownish-red fur all over its body, except for its face. Its face was tan-colored, but it had no fur or hair on it. I could see it had large eyes, and I think that they were black, but I really couldn't be sure because I wasn't close enough, and I still have no real idea. I watched for about ten minutes before it stopped what it was doing again and looked directly at me. I really thought there was no way that it could see me, so I didn't duck or try to hide or anything. I just stood there staring at it. It could see me, though, because it hollered over in my direction and as though it were talking to or otherwise trying to communicate with something I couldn't see. It pointed up at me. 
I wanted to duck or get down from the tree stand and run as fast as I could back home, but my legs didn't seem to want to work. I was terrified, and my heart sank as I realized it could see me. I bent over for a moment to try and stop myself from passing out, and when I looked back up, the creature was gone. Well, I could no longer see it anyway. I wanted to go to the beach and look and see if there was any fresh footprints before the tide came in and washed them all away. I didn't have a camera or anything with me, but at that point, I just needed to prove to myself that I wasn't crazy or seeing things. I needed to prove it to myself that Bigfoot existed. There was no question in my mind at that point either of what I had just seen. I climbed down quickly from the tree and started the somewhat treacherous hike to the beach. I noticed the path I was taking was the same one where I had seen the grass and trees parting and moving earlier, as though someone were walking through it when there was no one and nothing else there. It took me about 20 minutes, but finally, I made it to the beach. The second I exited the tree line and stepped a foot onto the shore, I felt that strange feeling again, like I was being watched. There was no one and nothing there, though. That horrible stench was back as I looked around and saw dozens of gigantic footprints all over the sand. There weren't any where I had seen the Bigfoot, though, because the water had already washed them away. It had been standing with its feet in the water as it caught its meal. I was afraid to walk forward because I felt once again like I was being watched and like I wasn't alone. However, there were no other human beings and no animals as far as the eye could see. I heard a loud grunting noise coming from the right about where I had seen the Bigfoot before, and that's when I knew that it was still there. That it had been there all along, and if I went any closer, I would then be approaching it. I also didn't think it was alone, and knew somehow deep down inside that it had been a Bigfoot that had invisibly walked past me while I was sitting on the stump, and it was more than likely just watching me as I dug for worms as I first recognized that I wasn't alone anymore in the forest. I turned and ran as fast as I could back to my house. I left the bucket and all the worms I'd collected along with my lunch in those woods. I never got them back. I was excited, but I knew my mom and siblings might not believe me, but was hopeful that my father would. However, by the time he got home from work that night, it was too late to go trekking through the dark forest, and so we waited until the morning to walk together to the beach. When we got there, nothing was left of the footprint. I had seen there the day before, but both of us felt extremely uncomfortable in that area, like we were being watched. Also, I will never forget how strong that horrible smell was when we were out there that day and so many other times too when we were in the woods together or when I was all alone. That's how I always knew a Bigfoot was around, even when I couldn't see one with my eyes. My dad, my dad believed me and he would tell me the story about when I saw a Bigfoot on his land on the shore, in the forest, to anyone who would listen. No one dared question or mock him because it would have been considered disrespectful, but I don't think many people believed him. He believed me, though, and before long, he was joining me on my excursions into the woods as much as possible, and it didn't take long for us to see one of them. While we were together, 
It was absolutely fascinating. And while I know they exist all over the world nowadays, I think Alaska is the perfect place to find one because it really is the last frontier. And there is so much untouched land here. Even today, I think I figured out and bore witness to a lot of the reason why no one can ever seem to catch a good picture or video and why they aren't able to catch any sort of evidence of its existence and that that they can disappear or phase out at will. I also believe they make their own portals wherever they stand if they need to and that's how they get out of there when they feel like a human is threatening them or even just trying to capture photographic or video evidence. Honestly, I think someone trying to catch any evidence of them is threatening in and of itself to a Bigfoot. But that's just my opinion. On to the next one. behind a swamp in an apple orchard in Calhoun County in Michigan. This was October, just after my birthday. It was getting chilly in the late afternoon. My friends and I were bored, so we decided to go walking around in the woods adjacent to my home, which was a one-room schoolhouse my dad was remodeling. We did these walks often, looking for cool places to build forts or just exploring. This time, we went further back through an old apple orchard, and that's when it happened. As we were walking, we both noticed it was really quiet. No sounds of birds or animals. Nothing at all. We were a little amazed at the silence. Then, the wind picked up a little, which blew the leaves around. There were still a lot on the trees. The leaves blowing broke the silence, so we started to move on. I had this weird feeling of being watched. I told my friend. He said he had it too. At that moment, we both heard this loud thumping crunch. I said, do you hear that? He nodded yes. Afraid to talk because it was loud and close, probably 50 feet away. It was like something had stomped the ground. I said it sounded like it came from over there. Turning to the direction of the noise, we both saw this big upright animal covered in hair. It immediately moved into the deep brush and trees while making this deep kind of throated noise. All we could see was the back three quarters, the way up the stomach, the butt, and the left leg going into the brush. It wasn't crouching. It was upright, like it was just walking by. I started running, not thinking of my friend. I ran as fast as I could to my house, which was about 350 feet away through dense brush, partial swamp, and a trail. When I stopped, my friend was right there, which surprised me because I thought I could run faster than him. This thing's leg was at least as tall as me. I was about five foot four at 14 years old. It was dark reddish with some gray in it about three to four inches long. The fur was super thick. Its leg was thicker than my body. Out of the blue, my friend recently visited me. We haven't seen each other since high school, and we're both in our 40s now. The second thing he asked was, Do you remember what we saw behind your house? I told him, Yeah, we saw a darn Bigfoot, and I don't think I have ever run so fast or strong since, not even when I was in the Marines. Since then, I have been always watching for those critters. There were deep impressions in the ground, trees broken, loud screams before and after. At the time, I thought the screams were owls. Now, I know better. I haven't heard of anyone else reporting anything in this immediate area. It was around 4 to 5 p.m. and getting dark. The weather was fair, overcast. It had rained for a couple of days prior. The area was an apple orchard that was abandoned and overgrown with a lot of sumac trees, choke cherry, and thick brush bordering swamp as well as the old one-room schoolhouse. On to the next one. On a full moon night, 
at Fletcher's Pond, west of Alfina, Michigan, myself and a friend, Adam, decided to go fishing for bass. We were in the cove for some time. Since it was a full moon, we did not bring a flashlight. Around the midnight hour, we hear this roar coming from the shoreline, which was black due to the thick wood, and we were in the water. Within seconds, something splashed into the water about ten feet or less from the boat. We were both pretty startled and speechless. We just started the motor and headed back to the lodge, Paradise Lodge. Of course, we were teased about it, and Adam would not even say a thing. The following day, another friend, Joe and myself, went in search of anything. We had to go by boat to get to the area where the roar came from. It was known as the hunting club property and my first time there. As far as I know, there were no buildings, but plenty of cover and trails, which we walked on from the shore and came upon a small pond with slight inclined banks of sandy ground. To our findings, we did find very large footprints. You could make out the toes as they were heading up from the incline from the water. Then, on our way back to the shore and the boat, my friend Joe got a little ahead of me. To my right was a thicket that you could not even see anything in this area. That is when I heard a limb snap, scaring the heck out of me so much I could not even call out to Joe. I just froze in my steps, looking into the thicket as hard as I could without seeing anything. Then we left and that was pretty much the end of it. I still share the story now and then, but I don't think anyone believes it. The only two witnesses were myself and Adam, whom I have not seen since that summer, and Joe is deceased. After telling our story, we heard there was a sighting in around the Hillman area before that time. It was 12 a.m. We were on the water. The shoreline is thick. On to the next one. In a swamp between two hills in Roscommon County in Michigan, a friend and myself were coming home from a party about 10.30 at night. We were in his Chevy van. Something ran out in front of us. He slammed on his brake, and this large animal on two legs bent at the waist looked right at us three to four feet away. It was close enough to see the pupil, and its eyes were bloodshot. The small head was not that of a bear. It had long, brown, matted hair with a blonde tint here and there. As it went by watching us, I felt it was scared. I continued to watch, and it was bent at the waist, and its hip was level with my vision in the van. This all happened very quick. Four to five steps, and it cleared the road. Another car was coming at us and went into the ditch. We drove on about two minutes. I said to my friend, Did you see something back there? And he stopped the van and said, I didn't want to say anything. I asked him, Tell me what you saw. And I was not crazy either. We have both told the story here and there, but have never told the police. No one would believe us. You do not have to believe us either, but it is the truth. There were two of us. He was driving, and I was a passenger. So I ended up with my face close to the windshield when he locked up the brake. I never went back. I wouldn't want to run into this thing in the woods. The outcome would have only one end. It was 10.30 at night. Lighting was good. There was a thick swamp on both sides of the road. On to the next one. At Luna Pier in Monroe County in Michigan, it was late September, mid-morning on a Saturday, with a sunny, calm, cool weather, perfect for squirrel hunting. So off I went, not telling anyone where I was going. I had a number of different spots. I headed for a small woodlot, maybe 10 acres in size, less than a mile from my house. This woodlot is about a third of a mile from the nearest road, surrounded by farmland with a small stream on the south side and with several fence rows attached. It had a farmer's lane that went through it in a rough L shape with a grass and dirt base and large enough to drive on. Such woodlots are a fairly common feature of the southeastern Michigan farming landscape. If anything, the woodlot was smaller than most. 
The lane enters the woodlot from the north about half a mile and the road I first walked into the lane from. As I entered the woodlot, I noticed something quite odd. There were a large number of birds making a big racket in the underbrush in the woods just to the right of the lane. I noticed red wings, robins, jays, and cardinals in particular, and they were flirting about the underbrush in a somewhat frenzied fashion. Many times I had seen red wings gather in large noisy flocks, this time of year, pre-migration or cornfield raids. But gather high up, this was different. This struck me as strange. I continued my way, after fifty yards or so into the woodlot. I approached a small bend in the lane where it veers perhaps twenty degrees or so to my right. My rifle was still slung over my shoulder with a sling, since the hunting spot was on the other side of the woodlot near the lane exit on the west side. At the bend in the lane, I was still glancing back at the bird commotion. When I turned my head forward, again, I froze in shock and terror. Standing about twenty-five yards away was a huge, furry creature towering seven feet into the air and standing just like a man. It was staring seemingly straight through me and our eyes locked. It stood in the underbrush just off the left side of the trail. I could not see it below the waist, but I could see everything else. It could see me from head to toe. We just stared at one another. It was massive, three feet wide at the shoulders, incredibly stocky and strong looking. Reddish brown hair was everywhere, shorter on the face, but perhaps three to five inches long on the head and shoulders. The hair was quite unkempt and mop like, especially on the top of the head. The head was large, seemingly flat on top. I could not make out any ears. Eyes, a simple black, no white, and a lying flat nose without many discernible features. There was even some hair there in the middle of the face. The mouth was large, with a bit more hair there, given the appearance a sort of mustache. It did not have much expression, pretty much straight-lipped. It really seemed almost relaxed. Its arms hung at its side, with its hand in the underbrush. There were no signs of aggression. Perhaps that is what kept me from panicking, and neither it nor I moved a muscle. The eerie stare seemed to last forever. My mind raced desperate to escape. I felt that turning and running might encourage it to chase me, and I knew I could never outpace it. I did not attempt to unsling my rifle, fearing that it might consider such a move aggressive. Also, it was only a single shot twenty-two, obvious of little use for something that size. The rifle was chambered but uncocked, and if the creature charged, I would probably not even have the time to cock it. I did not want to shoot this creature, but I would in self-defense. So, barely moving my hand that was at my side, I could reach back to the bolt knob and try to cock the gun while it was still flung on my shoulder. I could move the spring a little, trying several times, but from there I could just not get enough leverage to pull it all the way back. I will never forget how hopeless I felt at that moment. I had no idea what to do next. I just stood there. Then the creature made it move. Its large, hairy right hand came up and swiped at the red buried shrub right in front of it. It moved the hand to its mouth and casually chewed. It repeated these motions, glancing down to the shrub, swiping up the berries and eating, then glancing back up to me. The arm motion was very fluid and unhuman-like, no jerking motion very deft flowing movement. The left hand remained at the creature's side. It was not picking berries like a person would. It was raking them up. Also, during the entire encounter, I never heard any vocalizations or smelled any odors. Watching it eat, I started to feel better. I was no longer this creature's only concern, so I took this as an invite to leave. I slowly began to walk backward and this creature continued to eat and keep an eye on me. I slipped around the bend and lost sight of the creature after a few feet. I turned around and quickened my pace into a fast walk, not wanting to alert the creature that I was running or in panic. I continued to look back to the bend in the lane, fearing it would follow. 
Soon, I was at the woodlot edge and broke into a full run. First, finally, only to run faster did I unsling my rifle. I was 15 years old and probably did not take me two weeks afterward to clam up about this for obvious reasons. I told my future wife and am now reporting it to you. It just feels like it is time. It took me over a year to return to the spot. It was mid-morning, sunny, calm, and cool weather. Since it occurred in a lane in the woodlot, it was fairly bright, not mid-forest dim. On to the next one. In 2019, Jeremy, a lifelong hunter and Texas resident, appeared on a paranormal podcast to discuss his Bigfoot encounters. As a teenager, he observed what he believed at the time to be an escaped chimpanzee in the East Texas woods. The creature crossed in front of Jeremy's vehicle in broad daylight as he was driving back roads looking for deer. It was quadrupedal, running like an ape, yet would have been about six feet tall had it stood upright, quite large for a chimpanzee. Despite this early encounter with something simian in the woods of North America, Jeremy remained uninterested in the Bigfoot phenomena until later in life. While recovering from an injury, Jeremy began watching YouTube videos where he stumbled upon stories of Bigfoot, where he heard more Bigfoot stories from East Texas. Jeremy started visiting areas around Sam Houston National Forest to look for Bigfoot. After a number of possible encounters, Jeremy heard loud tree breaks, growls, and what he suspected to be a Bigfoot mimicking dogs and owls on different occasions. He began noticing a white light in the woods. From a distance, it appeared to be a single light, but when viewed through binoculars, Jeremy determined it was indeed two lights side by side like eyes. They would move back and forth. As I looked through binoculars, you could tell there was two eyes. He was adamant. The illumination was eye glow, not eye shine. This was eye glow. Without me shining a light, there was no moonlight. There was no ambient light. I've hunted my whole life. I know what eye shine is. Jeremy returned to the location and saw on multiple occasions more than one set of eyes glaring from the darkness. I saw another set of white eyes and then a set of red eyes, he recalled. They're all eye glow. They all move. They all duck. You'll see them up high, maybe seven or eight feet high. Then you'll see them down by the ground level, moving back and forth and trying to duck. They realize I'm looking at them. This eye glow even changed colors. That one really bothered me. I've got goosebumps right now talking about it, just thinking about it. Jeremy had driven down some dirt roads in the forest close to death. He stopped in a particularly remote area to pick up firewood to use for his campsite. I got out of my Jeep and something screamed at me. Jeremy decided he should leave the area. On the way back to his camp, he caught sight of the eye glow once more. Through the trees, I could see two sets of eyes floating. They were moving so fluidly, not even making any noise that I could hear. It was two distinct sets of eyes coming through the woods, and then they kind of split up. And then I lost them. Back at his campsite, Jeremy built a fire before relieving himself by the tree line. Looking into the woods, he spotted the eye glow again. I see these eyes and they're almost as big as tennis balls. I'm not exaggerating. They were at least nine inches to a foot apart. Jeremy also made out a silhouette of the creature by the light of his headlamp. This thing was a monster. It was over ten feet tall. The size of this thing's head, though, the only thing I can say is this was a monster. I think maybe I pissed this thing off. When I got screamed at, at that area, that was real remote. I got followed back to my campsite. This thing's eyes, not only were they far apart and huge, but were changing colors from green to blue to white. Green to blue to white. Green to blue to white. 
They were changing color fast. I've never seen that before or since. I've never seen anything that big in my life. Jeremy returned to camp and experienced more activity throughout the night, including what he believes were bluff charges as the creature or creatures ran at him from the woods. He spent the remainder of the night in his jeep. It still shakes me up when I think about what the heck I saw, he added. Beyond simple illumination, the eyes of large, hairy hominids sometimes emit beams of light. In the summer of 1972, a 15-year-old Bianca Esther Cardena Rain was walking to her grandmother's house on an isolated hill outside of Huladad, Chile, when a six-foot-five tall creature climbed from a ditch alongside the road. It was covered in long, black hair and glared at her with large, shining eyes. Paralyzed with fear, Bianca stared into the creature's eyes, which seemed to emit a fiery beam of light. She felt an electrical discharge, then began running toward her grandmother's house. The creature followed, making strange leaps and loud, screeching sounds. At a clearing near her grandmother's house, the creature finally turned and departed in another direction. What meaning can we make from these wandering hairy men with fiery eyes? If Bigfoot or something that reflects in some way our folklore and mythology and presents itself to us as the wild man archetype, then perhaps these glowing eyes take on a symbolic meaning in the same way that so many folklore creatures and other things like Bigfoot seem to be fond of walking on roofs suggests an otherness to their action. Perhaps then the glowing eyes are a vital clue that the Bigfoot possesses a kind of inner fire. Researcher and author John Keel himself noted that glowing eyes separated the natural from the unnatural. Self-luminous eyes, according to Keel, suggest a paraphysical entity rather than a real animal. Keel defined these paraphysical enemies as the phantoms that come crashing out of the bushes late at night. They seem to be part of something else. Jeff a self-described Bigfoot enthusiast from York County, Pennsylvania, presented a different theory on glowing eyes. Upon witnessing several unexpected lights, which Jeff attributed to Bigfoot eye glow, in an area of repeat high strangeness, codenamed Site 7, Jeff proclaimed that the Bigfoot creatures used their eye glow to communicate with each other using some sort of code based on the color, intensity, and duration of the light. Jeff further asserted that one could determine the mood of the Bigfoot according to the color. Red glow, Jeff warned, indicated an angry Bigfoot. Red does seem to carry some weight as a warning color in the natural world. Writing for the British Natural History Museum, Katie Provid reports ladybugs sport their bright red wings as a warning to birds who may try to eat them. Many species of ladybugs have chemicals within their bodies which make them taste awful. The more intensely red, the fouler the taste. Black widow spiders sport the famous red hourglass on its abdomen, warning against its powerful venom. Provid continues, studies have revealed that red is associated with aggression and dominance in fish, reptiles, and birds. If Bigfoot are natural creatures, are they using the decidedly unnatural feature of eye glow to communicate warnings to their witnesses. While red, the most commonly reported color of Bigfoot eye glow, has traditional associations of danger and anger, as well as alternatively love and desire, it seems a leap of logic to ascribe human color symbolism to the eyes of Bigfoot creatures. If red glowing eyes express warning, are we to assume that shining green eyes suggest beckoning or safety? What are we to make of then of the color-changing eyes, as Jeremy reported in Texas. The only true answer, as with so many aspects of Bigfoot phenomenon, is we don't know. On to the next one. In Dorchester County in Maryland, this incident occurred on a surf trip to Ocean City, Maryland. 
with my high school friend and surfing buddy. I'm not sure where exactly, but it was between a number of farms and on a road off of 404, which we considered a shortcut. The area was dense pine trees, and I would guess it was late spring as there was no traffic at all. We were traveling between 3 and 4 a.m. We were moving at about 60 to 70 miles per hour and looking out for deer and were very much awake. I saw a pair of eyes off in the woods some ways up, perhaps a hundred meters, when I noticed them, and as we were closing rapidly, I braked fairly heavily. My friend and I saw what I can only describe as an absolutely enormous, hairy creature moving very fast from the passenger side of the road to the left side. I would estimate it to be at least eight feet to the shoulder and hunched forward almost on four legs, but definitely not a quadruped. It was positively terrifying, and we both looked at each other and said, what the heck was that? I will never forget the size of the thing. Neither of us have any idea what it was, but both of us were outdoorsmen and camped regularly and experienced in the woods. For many years afterward, we have speculated what it was, and I think I may have told three or four people about it, but never was taken entirely seriously. There was no moon, so it was unusually dark, and additionally, we were between two large pine forests, which blocked in any starlight. The eyes were very bright as the headlights hit them, and orange in a way that was not a deer or a cat or a bear. Two witnesses, myself driving, and my friend who was navigating, and both of us keeping a sharp lookout for deer as we had driven the route many times late at night and early in the morning before. The incident occurred around 3 or 3.30 a.m., and there was no pre-dawn glow, so I would hazard to guess that it was closer to 3. I do not recall there being a moon, as it was exceptionally dark. On to the next one. in Allahanny County in Maryland. It was off the road. I was kind of lost. I tend to do that, though I do not really know where I was. I was in the woods off of Georgia's Creek Boulevard. I was playing near a creek on an elevated point. I happened to glance up into a thicket about 30 yards away. There was a creature about as tall as a small tree beside it. I guess the tree was around eight feet tall. It was a muscular shape with brownish-grayish colored hair. Surprisingly, the feet were not as large as you would think, but yet they were still larger than an average human being. He turned around and began to walk towards the creek above the hill. In a fright, I ran away. I never saw it again. The only witness was just me. I was lost. It was fairly dry season, and the main creek on the top of the mountain began to start drying out. We were in the middle of a drought. The sun was shining through the tops of the trees. On to the next one. I first became aware that the Bigfoot species is real when I was 13 years old and lived just outside of Ashland, Oregon. I was always very passionate about wildlife spending a lot of my time in my youth watching all sorts of BBC shows and anything and everything that was narrated by David Attenborough. So naturally, I spent a lot of time outside, even when it was pouring rain. I loved to throw on a poncho and walk around on the trails near my house. There was something about that feeling that was so magical, I can't even describe it. This one summer, I had become partially interested in this one type of caterpillar. There was such an infestation of them that they would often fall from the trees where they were nesting. I remember how I was scooping up a couple of them to put in a jar when I realized that they had fallen into what looked like an enormous footprint. That track was so pronounced that I knew right away I had stumbled upon something miraculous. As I turned my attention forward, 
I noticed that wasn't the only track in the area. I was able to locate about two or three others, however, the initial track was the most prominent. I got a little overly excited and ran back to my house to get my dad to come back there with me to check it out. By the time we got there, which was only maybe 20 minutes later, I was unable to relocate the track. I was so frustrated at that moment because I could tell my dad thought I had imagined it. It's not like I blame him for that. Would you believe a 13-year-old child about that sort of thing? One who is obsessed with anything that has to do with the wilderness. Even though I couldn't find the track, I still had the feeling that there was for sure something highly unusual roaming around the area. My dad could tell I was frustrated about whatever I thought I had seen, and to poke a little more fun at me, he remarked how maybe I should get a pair of night vision goggles so that I'd be able to see whatever was out there. Even though he was joking, it made a lot of sense to me, and that was what I'd end up asking for as my birthday gift, which was only a few weeks after that. As soon as I received those goggles, I spent a lot of time camping in the pitch black night. I did my best to refrain from using any light that would draw attention to my whereabouts, as I wanted to observe the natural habitat with minimal forms of human intrusion. It surprises me now to think about how my parents would allow me to be out there all by myself. I suppose they thought I was close enough to the house that I would be safe, but even though they didn't believe in Bigfoot, I'm not sure why they were confident a cougar wouldn't take its chances with me. I spent many nights out there without anything through those goggles that appeared to be out of the ordinary. I'll estimate that it must have been over ten nights. Still, I kept my belief going strong and continued to camp outside any chance I got. I have to be honest, it's kind of crazy to think how determined I was to spot one of these creatures in the wild. What I thought I was looking for ended up being quite different in reality. There was this one night when I was lying in my tent and reading a Harry Potter book when I heard something that didn't make too much sense. It was around 11 p.m., and it sounded like a robin was chirping somewhere in the vicinity. From what I knew, robins didn't chirp at night. Since I was reading, I did have a little nightlight switched on, and that likely helped whatever was in the area to be aware of my presence. The thing is, if I hadn't known that robins were inactive at nighttime, I wouldn't have even thought to put the goggles on at that time. When I did a 360 scan of the environment, I soon landed on a very peculiar figure. It appeared as though I was looking at a giant human, but the arms appeared to be about twice as long. It was right then and there that I knew I was looking at whatever was responsible for the footprint. And even though I was obviously intrigued, as well as satisfied that my hunch had been correct, I was also overcome with nervousness. That nervousness didn't come from my excitement, it came from fear. I somewhat wanted to lower the goggles from my face, but I also wanted to be sure that the figure was not interested in coming too much closer. As I looked at it for a few minutes, the figure would sporadically sway, almost like its body was convulsing. Then, Something incredibly strange happened. I watched as a second figure stepped out from behind the first one. It was previously so hidden that it was almost like the first figure had cloned itself right before my eyes. Because of the colors displayed in the night vision goggles, the sight reminded me of what looked like when cells split beneath a microscope. My fear exponentially increased when the second figure appeared to drop down on all fours and run to the left side of the first figure. The first figure continued to stand in the same place. I know it was reckless, but the closest thing I ever carried to a weapon while camping was a Swiss army knife. Since it was all I had, 
I steadily reached for it while simultaneously trying to keep sight of the figure that was now moving very quickly around me. It started to become clear that the second figure was closing in on my tent, and I foolishly yelled out the words, Stay away! The second figure ceased all movement, but when I tried to locate the first figure, I couldn't see anything near where it originally stood. It suddenly felt as though they were toying with me. It was like they knew I was watching them. But how could the creatures have any idea I had been watching them through the night vision goggles? It wasn't long after that that I could hear these long, deep breaths only a few feet away from my tent, and they came off to my left. That noise startled me so bad that I lost grip of the goggles and they fell onto the fleece blanket that lay below my knees. It was then that I regretted spending the night out there. It also felt like a miracle to me that I had survived all those previous nights untouched. It was any second that I thought I was going to get crushed within my tent, but the breathing continued from the same place. I couldn't tell if the creature was waiting for me to make a move or was merely observing me. Either way, I started to get the impression that the creature wasn't starving, otherwise I'd already have been dead. I'm a bit embarrassed to say I just sat there shaking, but I was only 13 years old. I would have been snapped like a twig by the creatures of that size without any room to struggle. I'm not sure how long I sat there, frozen, but the breathing was interrupted by a faint dialogue that emanated from maybe 40 yards behind me. At first, I thought a couple of foreign men had walked into the vicinity and were possibly even hunting the creatures, and then, as one of the voices turned into a very animalistic-sounding grunt, it dawned on me that these organisms have an intricate speech of their own. I think that the mimicking of animal noises is intended to help them blend in with the natural environment. I wonder if they only do it when they suspect that humans are nearby to keep people thinking that nothing is out of the ordinary. Of course, some people have been trained to notice that sort of thing. I'm a big believer that if you spend enough time in the wilderness, you do indeed sharpen your senses to the point where you almost always know when something is off. As everything fell completely silent, I failed to spot either of the creatures through the night vision goggles. That's something that still stumps me to this day. How could they have been that fast to get out of the area? The only other theory I can come to is that I was in such an intense state of shock that much more time than I had realized passed before I quietly returned the bulky goggles to my eyes. I so badly wanted to be back in my bed, as I'm sure you can understand, but I was way too afraid to move. I was relieved when the sun finally came out, but there is still no way I can be sure that those beings weren't near my tent. There was something about them that felt almost supernatural. It was like I had lived through a scene in a sci-fi movie that was difficult to conceptualize. When I made it back to my house, the first thing I did was wake my parents up and tell them about what I had just been through. As I said those words out loud, the more I realized that it wasn't helping them to believe my case. It's crazy how all this has been going on so close to them and that these creatures have been among us, yet they found the notion of Bigfoot to be ridiculous. It makes me question how many cases like that are going on, not only in the United States, but around the globe. Since I had originally found those tracks so close to the house, I was confident that if I stayed up late, and surveyed the property with my night vision goggles, I'd see at least something noteworthy. Then I would be able to prove it to my parents. I remember feeling so determined to prove at least something to them. When I think back on it, I think it was because I wanted somebody else to feel what I had been feeling. The chilling epiphany that these beings are part of our reality. I was frustrated when many weeks passed by before I again even saw a hint of strange activity, and what I saw wasn't enough to show my parents, even if I had had adequate time to summon them. While I was sitting on my back porch, I saw 
what looked like a glob gliding through the tree, maybe somewhere around 80 yards out. It was weird because it looked like it was flying below the trees, and at times, it seemed to almost take on a human form before returning to a blob form. I know that sounds weird, but I don't know how else to put it. I don't think I even told my parents about that sighting because I felt all it would do would further influence them to undermine everything I had been saying. If I remember correctly, it was on the following night when I put on the night vision goggles and saw one of the figures within the vicinity. Even though I was scared, I was excited, and I speed walked over to my parents' bedroom to get them. It ended up being a huge mistake for me to get them. After I dragged my dad into my bedroom to look out the window, he tossed the goggles away from his face and ran out the back door, yelling at the mysterious beings. I should have known that he would have perceived them to be human trespassers. I felt rather irresponsible at that moment, as my mother and I yelled for him to get back inside. We noticed that he went silent. He would be the first of us to see what these things looked like from head to toe. That was when all of the ear-piercing screams began. For a few moments, it was as if there were a group of ladies in the backyard screaming like they were all getting stabbed with kitchen knives. It was the most horrific noise. I do my best not to think too much about it. Worried that something was about to happen to my father, my mother ran outside, intending to guide him back in the house. She also must have seen the trespassers because her scream was very distinct compared to theirs. She must have suspected that I was about to come outside because she immediately screamed at me to stay where I was. When both of my parents made it inside and locked the door, my mother rushed for the telephone and called the police. As we waited for them to get there, my dad passed me the night vision goggles after he turned them on and saw nothing there. It was strange how they still sounded like they were close, but he said he saw the figures way off in the distance past the woods. Strangely enough, when the police arrived, the creatures were still in the vicinity, hollering up a storm. They were so noisy that it made all of us wonder how we had never heard anything like it before. We concluded that it was a family of Bigfoot, and that this must have been the first time that they migrated through our area. Both police officers walked out into the backyard with my goggles and took a peek. They confirmed that they did see what looked like a group of individuals strolling through the woods, but they appeared to be off the property, so there was nothing they could do. My dad quickly found that story to be fishy. And to this day, he insists that those officers knew the truth about what we had encountered. They just didn't want to speak the truth because it probably went against protocol. They could hear the noises of the creatures, which by that point had transitioned into what sounded like bickering. I think my dad's hunch is accurate because those policemen clearly had no interest in going out there to confront those so-called men. I remember hoping that they would at least fire a warning shot into the air so that the beings would think twice before coming back to our land. But they did no such thing. Before leaving, they reassured us that they would send someone to the other side of our property to intercept the group of intruders. Whether that was true or not, I cannot say. All I know is that those two fellows did not want to get close to them. I've always wondered if they merely left the whole thing alone or if they did call in for reinforcements that were more equipped to handle that sort of thing. After that night, things were still weird around the house for quite a while. My parents often debated whether we should move away from the area, but as time went on without any additional incidents, we all began to settle back into a fairly normal routine. My dad even ended up getting a second pair of night vision goggles so that we could both keep watch once the sun went down. Maybe the police officers were telling the truth when they said they would handle things, although I never heard any gunshot or anything like that at that point. We only lived in that house for another year or so before we moved to Colorado for other reasons. There's a large part of me that's disappointed I never got to see what these beings looked like. I never got to see what these beings looked like. But both of my parents get a little uncomfortable when we talk about it, 
especially my mom, but they both agree that the creatures looked like oversized humans covered with long, shaggy, dark hair. My dad always makes a point to say that their eyes were spread unusually far apart. Still, my parents saw them in very poor light, so they could only perceive certain details, and understandably, it was such a traumatic experience for both of them that they were probably much more focused on getting away from the intruders than anything else. For some reason, it was a big deal to me when my dad apologized for not believing that I had found those tracks while I was examining caterpillars. I think it's safe to assume that none of us will ever reside in a heavily wooded area again. On to the next one. Fiction, Jennifer screamed, inappropriately loud. Pure fiction. We all just rolled our eyes, because though the volume was inappropriate, the behavior was not unexpected from her. She always had to be the center of attention, and she would attempt to grab that attention with melodrama and theatrics regardless of circumstance. At the moment, she was referring to the dogman stories we had been exchanging prior to dropping her off at her house. We had to abort our weekend plans. See, this all started like so. Jennifer, as she demands to be called, not Jenny or Jen, but Jennifer, lest she'll start crying. Jennifer was the cousin of our schoolmate Elfie, and Elfie asked if she could bring Jennifer because she was driving her mother crazy, and she needed a few days free of her. After five minutes around Jennifer, I could see why. We all could. She had to be one of the biggest negative suckles I have ever encountered. She was at least a decade older than the rest of us. And this Jennifer was the most self-absorbed, manipulative loser I think I have ever had the displeasure of being around. After a couple ticks with her in the car, I realized I could not even stand asking this person for help at Walmart let alone going on a road trip with her. But we wanted to help Elfie, who was a really nice person, and she was the only one of us at Northern that actually grew up in the Upper Peninsula, so most of her family was still in the surrounding area. She had heard stories about the dogman of Copper Harbor growing up, but never made the trip northwest, so this was going to be a first for all of us. And as we headed north to Copper Harbor, I just kept hoping we would spot the dog man and he would eat Jennifer. Seemed like it would solve everyone's problems, including hers. Nevertheless, we were stuck with this raving lunatic for the weekend. And after the first half hour, it was obvious why Jennifer's mother needed to get away from her. She was clinical. Initially, she would not shut up. She was a chatty know-it-all. Then, when Britt disagreed with her about something, she became moody and silent. Then began to pout. Then weep. All this because Britt told her that she did not want to discuss politics on this trip. Really? Then Jennifer would not talk to anyone. Yeah, the silent treatment. Like a spoiled child. She nosed down into her smartphone and spent the rest of the drive on the first day moping. Great, I thought. At least she's not talking. Concluding, I'll take that as a win. When we stopped to eat, Jennifer stayed out in the car by herself, giving us all the cold shoulder. I'm sorry, Elfie, Britt told Elfie. I just don't want to spend the weekend in arguments over BS. I needed to get away from all that. No, Elfie told us. I'm the one who's sorry. She started. I should have just taken her to my dad's place or something. I'm afraid I ruined our weekend. Ah, uh, it's okay, Elfie. Ralph bellowed loud enough so that everyone in the little diner could hear. It takes all kinds. We'll make the best of it. Then he laughed. The four of us sat there in the diner, filling our bellies, while Jennifer, the drama queen, sat outside in the cold car, pathetically eating her bag of chips. You guys don't know the half of it, Elfie started. Lay it on us, Ralph encouraged. 
She is driving her mother crazy. Elfie shook her head. She doesn't work. She hasn't in years. She has been divorced three times. Now that is surprising. I would have thought a charming girl like that, I put in sarcastically. Seriously, Elfie continued. She is a mess. She sits at home all day on the internet, trolling people. That is all she does. Elfie scrunched up her face. Her mom said sometimes she is shouting at the computer. She is screaming at people on these dating sites, calling them names. Elfie shook her head. Her mom thought it was just, you know, jilted lover stuff. Until one time she came home early and Jennifer was in the bathroom with her phone and left the computer browser open. That when her mother saw these comments she was writing and confronted her. What happened, Britt asked? Well, she found out that Jennifer had all these fake accounts that she was creating just to bash people online. She had over a hundred different accounts on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and all she would do all day was insult people, Elfie finished, exasperated. Wow, I started. She's like in her thirties, right? Oh, She's older than that, Elfie shook her head. Yeah, that's not going to have a happy ending, I concluded. I'll say, Elfie continued. She put all this energy into hating people. That's all she does. She is jealous of everyone, offended by everyone, angry that her life is a mess. So she has all these stupid fake accounts where she assaults people via the internet, then agrees with herself under a different fake name. Elfie told us. Ralph, Britt, and I burst out laughing. Yeah, that's every loser's dream, Ralph smiled. And all from the comfort of her mother's house, Britt laughed. Her mother is going crazy. She said that Jennifer is worse than a child, Elfie told us. She is, I put in. From what I have seen, she is. Everyone nodded in agreement. A spoiled brat child. Yeah, her mother blames herself, Elfie began during her french fries around on the plate next to her partially eaten burger. She keeps saying that she should have not let her get away with so much. Elfie looked up. Anyway, I'm sorry, guys. I'm really... I guess I just thought that she might snap out of it once we got her out of the house. But she is even worse than I remember. It's okay, Britt told Elfie. Like Ralph said, it takes all kinds, and we can put up with her for the weekend. And, seriously, what better bait to lure out the dog man? I started, and the three of them laughed. But when I mentioned dog man, I noticed a table of four guys behind us looked up. At first, I thought maybe I was being too loud. But as we finished our meal, I heard the term dog man whispered a couple of times from that crew. So I decided I would ask them on our way out. As we got up to leave, the waitress gave Elfie a full order to go, wrapped in a brown paper bag. What's that? Britt asked. For later? No, Elfie started. I ordered it for Jennifer, in case she's hungry. Enabler, Britt sternly shot back. You think? Elfie responded sincerely. Yeah, I do, Britt answered. She pout and you buy her dinner? Britt stared at Elfie. Don't reward bad behavior. Oh my god, Elfie realized. You're right. Yeah, why would she stop if you and her mother keep facilitating her little fit? Britt stood up and put her purse over her shoulder. But what if she gets hungry later and there's no food in the motel, Elfie asked. Well, she's an adult. I guess next time she will realize that there are consequences for pouting. Maybe that is how she cleans up the mess in her head, I told them. What am I going to do with this, Elfie asked, holding out the food. I'll take it, Ralph grabbed. I'll eat it later, he smiled. I'm always hungry. Well, let's go, Elfie said as she gave Ralph the food. She's probably out in the car, logged into her fake TripAdvisor account, writing bad reviews of this place. Giving it one-star reviews for terrible food she never tried, Ralph laughed. Then, logging in to her other accounts and agreeing with her fake review, Britt joined in. And you wanted to feed her, I scolded? What a pathetic life just sitting around hating other people, Ralph said. Well, that's what losers do, Britt agreed. Elfie took it all in as we passed the table of lumberjack-looking guys who I heard mention the dogman earlier. 
I straggled behind and was about to ask them if they heard of the dogman, but instead one of the chubby bearded guys stuffed into the seat behind the booth table beat me to it. Dogman, he called out. The others giggled. I was caught off guard and just gave them a dumb smile and dented my eyebrows. What's that? I asked. You mentioned the dogman, the guy answered, followed by a howl. The table laughed. A few of the other patrons looked up and laughed. Meanwhile, one of the other waitresses looked over nervously. I expected I was about to be ridiculed. Ain't no dogman here, buddy, the big man said. Okay, I nodded and began walking away uncomfortably. I had heard all I wanted to from them. Then the man turned to the others in the diner. Hey, any of you seen a dogman? He rumbled loudly. Then he howled like a late night drunk. Yeah, you got the wrong place for that young feller. An old weathered man at the table near the door told me, while never even looking up from his plate. Gotta go north for that. North, I asked. As far north as the road will take you, he nodded. But if you end up in the big lake, then you've gone too far. And that's another thing altogether. I was not from the Upper Peninsula. I was an engineering student at Northern Michigan University in my junior year. I was from Indianapolis. So my interaction with the Outer Rim locals in Upper Michigan had been limited, even after three years. So I was not sure what was going on. They seemed friendly enough, but also entirely weird. Go north, young man, the big man at the table barked and then it seemed the entire diner was laughing at me. At this point, Alfie, Britt, and Ralph had already left, so I was on my own to determine what was going on. I was done. I headed for the door. As I neared the car, I looked back into the diner through the fog of my breath and wide glass windows. I could see them all laughing and pointing in my direction. Then the guys at the booth table began howling. It was so loud, I could hear it lightly coursing across the parking lot. By the time I reached the car, I saw one of the guys at the table start lumbering around while the others inside the diner watched. He began lurching about, making wild faces, then started howling. Again, I could see the diner erupt in laughter. I started feeling more than uneasy. I was beginning to find the place threatening, as in, we needed to get the hell out ASAP. That was when I noticed no one was in the car. Then I saw Ralph picking at the food in the takeout bag he had already opened about 20 feet away, in the dim of the light's edge. What's going on? Where's Britt and Elfie? I called to him. He turned toward me, laughing my way, eating as he came. They went looking for what's-her-name, Jenny? She was not in the car when we got back. Not in the car? What the hell? Where'd she go? I don't know. We gotta go, man, I told Ralph as I looked back over my shoulder, hoping that the place had already forgotten about us. Me and Ralph got in the car. I got behind the wheel, closed the door, and started the car. Ralph quickly got into the passenger seat and quickly slammed the door. I put the car in gear and began to roll slowly out of our parking space. Where are we going, he asked. They're going to get lost if we move the ride, amigo. Yeah, I shot back. Which way did they go, I asked him. They went over there by the woods. They were calling for her, Ralph informed me. I wheeled the car around and immediately saw Britt and Elfie walking back without Jennifer. Hmm, didn't find her, I guess, Ralph surmised. I stopped the car and put the window down. Immediately, Britt informed me. We came back to the car and Jennifer was not here. I thought I saw something over by the trees. I stopped the car at the far end of the parking lot where the girls had been coming from I left the car running and the light shining into the wood, where Britt thought she might have seen Jennifer. We started calling for her as we walked to the tree line. We stopped where the asphalt met the dirt just before the trees. We stood there calling out for the girl. And I was angry. I already knew that it was just a stunt she was pulling to get attention. She wanted a pity party, and we were all invited. But... As I stood there, with steam rising off my body, boiling mad, I saw what looked like a massive footprint in the dirt. We moved around to get out of the way of the car's light so we could get a better look at it. Sure enough, it was a fresh indentation in the frosted turf right between the leaf-covered forest floor and the west end of the isolated parking lot. What is that? I asked. 
the crew gathered around, to the side and rear, as to not block the headlight from the car. That's scary, Alfie whispered. That looks like a giant footprint. That can't be a footprint. It's almost a yard long. Nothing is that big, Ralph began investigating. He squatted down by it. Did you guys see something over here, you think? Well, I saw... It looked like something moving into the trees. I don't know. It was dark. Britt stumbled out. Ralph stood up. This is fresh. This just happened, he concluded. Look, this mud has got frost on it. Still smooth. Then he pointed at the track. This mud is broken. No frost. Oh, give me a break, I told them. The drama queen is messing with you guys. I was so irritated. She stood here and kicked this hole in the ground to look like a footprint, because she knows we are looking for a dogman. Looked more like a Sasquatch than a dogman, Ralph observed. Ignoring Ralph, I continued my rant. She waited for you guys to come out looking for her, then she made some noise, walked into the woods. I raised my voice, calling toward the woods, and now she probably wants us to send out the state troopers looking for her. There was no noise. I didn't hear anything. Britt corrected me. That's not what got my attention. I don't know, Alec, Elfie shared. It's too cold to be staging a stunt out here. That's too much, even for her, don't you think? Don't underestimate her sickness or self-pity, I grumbled at Elfie. Meanwhile, Ralph, who had been studying the ground around the giant footprint, repeated his conclusion, louder this time and with more conviction. This definitely just happened. That scared Elfie and Britt. Let's go back to the car, Elfie decided. Good idea, Britt agreed. Let's drive around. Maybe she went into the diner to use the bathroom. I was the last to go back to the car, and as I was convinced, Jennifer was standing behind one of the trees in the woods waiting for her search party. I was already pissed off when I turned to tell them I was not going to go back into that creepy diner. But when I wheeled around and saw my friends staring at the cafe speechless, I could see I did not need to convince them of our need to leave immediately. I slowly walked up behind them and joined them in the car. The scene in the diner was chilling. All of the laughter and excitement of earlier was gone. Through the wide windows of the place, we could plainly see everyone in the cafe standing in place, staring out at us. None of them were moving. None of them were saying anything. They were all simply standing and staring at us with expressionless faces. We need to get the heck out of here, right now, I told them, and ran to the driver's side door. What about Jennifer? Elfie pathetically called out. Don't worry, Elfie, we're not leaving without your cousin, Britt scolded me as I opened the driver's side door and the rest of them began to pile in. I put the car in gear and backed up, turning the car toward the road over the protest of the others. My plan was to honk the horn and let the pathetic internet troll Jennifer know that we were leaving, with or without her sorry ass. But no sooner did I put the car in gear than did I see Jennifer walking towards us, shivering. She got in the back seat and said nothing. As I pulled away from the diner and into the dark forest highway, I saw the people in the diner still had not moved, but were perched, watching us roll out. Ralph turned all the way around in the passenger seat looking. What the heck is going on with those people? He laughed with relief. I don't know and I don't want to find out, I spat out. Where were you? Alfie snapped at Jennifer. What do you care? No one even came looking for me, she whimpered to herself. I had had enough. Yeah, look, Jenny, I called to the back seat. Jennifer, she corrected me. My name is Jennifer, not Jenny. Okay, Jennifer. The next time you do some crap like that, I'm leaving you out there, I shouted. I don't care how cold it is. He'll do it too, Ralph added. Elfie, Jennifer whined to her cousin, apparently expecting her cousin to come running to her defense. He's right, Jennifer. Elfie surprised all of us, not the least of which was Jennifer. I think this was a bad idea, she started. You don't want to come in with us. Then you wander off. I think we need to just take you back home. Oh my gosh, Jennifer gasped theatrically. I can't believe this. I disappear and no one even cares. And now you're blaming me? There was a lengthy pause at that point. 
I know for me, when I heard that, I realized that the girl really did have a serious mental problem. It seemed she was delusional, which had probably worsened with the constant attacking of people online under the guise of alternate personas. Clinical, Ralph whispered to me. Yeah, I thought, much more succinct. True enough. Then, I broke the pause. I'm not driving her back. I'm not going to turn around and go all the way back. We'll just cut things short tomorrow and do an abbreviated tour of Copper Harbor and roll back. I spoke calmly to everyone. Then I directed my comments to Jennifer, who was now openly weeping. Yeah, no need to cry, Jennifer. We'll get you home soon enough. I don't want to spend another minute where I'm not wanted, she snapped at me. Okay, I decided. That's enough, I told them. I slowed, then turned the car around and headed back in the opposite direction. We're taking you back now. Jennifer was surprised. The others were not. They knew I did not suffer fool. The car was dead silent. Then Jennifer was the only one talking. She began telling us how bad we were and then fashioned stories about how she only got out of the car to walk around in order to stay warm because we had abandoned her. It was really sickening. Ralph turned on the radio. I drove back mad as hell. We were already most of the way to Copper Harbor, and now, all the way back we had to go, our weekend ruined. I felt bad for Elsie. It wasn't her fault. I knew she felt guilty. She was only genuinely trying to help her cousin, but I think she realized too late that Jennifer was far worse than any weekend in the country was going to fix. So, as we got about a hundred yards away from the diner, I turned the headlights off and rode back past the place in the dark. Britt was sitting behind me and whispered, good idea. Ralph agreed with a yeah buddy, sneak all dark-like. The four of us were scared of what we had seen at the diner, and were nothing but happy to be leaving it and nerve-wracking to even have to drive past it. It was easy enough to see the road without headlights because there was a full moon and not especially dangerous as there really are no other cars on the road up there, especially that time of night. I was only pissed off that the drama queen had forced us to go by it again the opposite way in order to unexpectedly have to take Her Highness home. And just as I was about to cut the lights back on, I saw light behind us. They were coming out of the road from the diner. They were moving fast. The cars were peeling out onto the highway, going in the direction we had first turned, opposite the way we were now going. I slowed down and watched in the rearview mirror. I stopped the car and kept the lights off. As we sat there in the dark on that upper Michigan desolate highway, I watched five vehicles peel out of that diner driveway in a hurry, all headed north. The others had been watching with the same interest as me, while Jennifer continued her pointless weeping. What do you suppose that was all about, Ralph asked. I don't know. I guess maybe they... I started meandering. I don't know. In a hurry to go somewhere? Maybe they were running from something. I was about to turn the lights on when Elfie asked, all going the same direction? Maybe they all live that way, I told Elfie as I stared at her in the rearview mirror. And they are all rushing to go in the same direction at the same time Elfie followed. That was strange, as another car a few hundred yards behind rushed out in the same manner in the same direction, north. Yeah, Ralph agreed. That is the same way we were going, Elfie whispered. We all got quiet. They saw us turn that way when we left, Britt added. And they didn't see us come back this way just now, Ralph finished. Yeah, Elfie's voice shook. Alec, we need to get out of here, she told me. Keep the lights off, Britt warned. Yeah, keep the lights off, Ralph repeated. The drama queen stopped sniffling. Obviously, Jennifer was upset. Everything was not about her at that moment. But she was also not yet crazy enough to be obvious to the sense of mortal danger now filling the car. And dead people can't throw fit. I drove in the dark for it must have been a mile. Yeah, a mile or so. Then I felt comfortable enough to put the lights back on and increase the speed. But something was wrong. I was getting hot and cold flashes. At first, I thought it was just the fear, you know? It felt like an adrenaline rush, but it was getting so harsh that I knew something else was wrong. I don't feel good, I said almost as a conversational afterthought. 
but immediately Ralph and Britt joined in. Me too. I'm dizzy. I feel like I'm gonna puke, Britt squeezed out. Oh man, I thought it was just me, Ralph added. How far to the next town, Elfie asked. I don't, I'm not. I started but could not finish. I had to pull over. I immediately got out and threw up. And worse than that was the fact that after I'd puked, I did not feel any better. Not relief at all. This was serious. Usually when a person is sick, they vomit, they feel better, repeat. But this was like hell alive inside me. It was so bad that I didn't even realize right away that Britt and Ralph were already outside the car in the weeds doing the same thing as me. Then Ralph collapsed on the cold earth. I followed. Then Britt, on her hands and knees, did the same thing. The three of us were puking our guts up in the cold October moonlight of an empty Upper Peninsula Highway, and hoping the posse from Deliverance would not come this way looking for us. It has to be the food. Alfie, you're not sick, Ralph asked. No, she said, standing next to the dark car where she had turned off the light. No, I feel fine. She had the burger. We all had the chicken, Britt whined out, quickly followed by her throwing up again. Then there was another puke session. It was horrible. We finally caught our breath for a moment, but still, the vomit did not seem to make us feel any better. It just happened, but we were all still down for the count. I knew it was bad when I saw Britt lying in the mud, holding her stomach. Britt was the most finicky, picky, particular person. She would not even sit on a picnic bench without a paper towel under her butt, lest she get dirty. And here she was now, happy to collapse in the mud if she could only rest for a minute. It's funny in retrospect, but not at the time. Meanwhile, Jennifer, sitting in the car, now out of immediate danger, had returned to pouting, most probably because the puking was not about her. Are you guys going to be okay? Elfie asked nervously. I don't know, I gasped. I really don't, was all I could say. I'm sure it was not reassuring, but I could hardly even get that out before I commenced with the dry heave. Then we heard the howl. We were sick as petri dishes, but still we heard that stuff. We stumbled to our feet. You hear that? Ralph said in between heaves. Is that, is that those people? Do you think they followed us this way? Britt pleaded to understand. I was scared, but I remember thinking it sounded a long ways away. Like, I don't know. I'm guessing more than a mile, close enough to scare us, but still time enough to get away. I don't know, I literally spat out. Elfie, you and Jennifer sit up front, you drive, I ordered Elfie, as the three of us got in the back seat. Elfie answered, it's Dick, Alec, I can't drive Dick. Jennifer, can you drive Stick? Oh, so now you need me, she replied with the snottiest of tones. Can you drive Dick, I screamed at her. Then Elfie mumbled something to Jennifer, then Elfie turned back to me. She doesn't drive Alec. Oh, crap. I told Elfie and put my head down on the seat behind her, attempting to catch my breath. Then another howl. This one was just off the road, inside the wood. That is not people. That's an animal. Put up your windows, I told everyone. Then I turned my attention to Elfie. Elfie, just follow my instructions, okay? All right, she answered bravely. Just step by step, I told her. Then Ralph screamed. Did you see that? Did you see that? It's a werewolf, he gasped. Let's get the F out of here. His panic did not help matters. Elfie, left foot is for clutch only. Push that pedal down and turn the key, I told her. Then I got a flush of hot and cold. I went dizzy, almost passed out, then saw something big and hairy walk out of the trees by the road. Ugh, I remember gasping. Now give it a little gasp and let out the clutch. Of course, she barely touched the gas pedal, dropped the clutch hard, and the engine shut off with a mighty jolt. Then there was another howl that was so loud it rattled the window. There was screaming inside the car, but fortunately none of it was coming from Elfie. She remained cool and focused on the procedure. Good thing, too, because after a few more brutal stops, she finally got smooth and got us in first gear out of there. Then second gear, then threw it rough, and very slowly, she began getting the hang of it. But I will say, it is a strange scenario to be in, needing to rush away from something in a car, yet being relegated to 20 miles per hour for long stretches. 
but at least we were moving and not attacked. It felt like riding in a putt-putt car or a golf cart, but I had faith Alfie could navigate us to the next town, village, or whatever we had passed on the way here. I think you guys need to get to a hospital. You're poisoned or got salmonella or something. Keep taking small sips of water. Don't get dehydrated. I remember Alfie commanding us as she ground the gears and slowed again. Then, I remember she shifted into third gear. I felt maybe we could make it to a doctor if we just hung on. Suddenly, I woke up. I did not even remember passing out. I was only for a few seconds, but I was afraid because I was feeling worse, not better. And it looked to be the same with Ralph and Britt. Shift, I called to Alfie. Shift, I said again, as I could hear the gears overtaxed. The car was whining hard. Alfie was giving it too much gas for that gear, and we were probably seconds away from blowing the transmission. Alfie looked down at the floor shifter to check the diagram, then said, forth, okay. She pushed down the clutch, ground the gears, got it in fourth, dropped it in gear, and we sped up. Then, abruptly, I saw a team of dogs rush out into the road in front of us. There was nothing Elfie could do. She hit one of the dogs. She took her foot off the gas, and the car lurched to a violent stop. I jumped out of the car and staggered to the front, to see how bad it was. My car had a major dent, but would still be drivable, and the dog lay motionless on the far side of the road, probably deceased. The other dogs had disappeared. Get in the car, Alfie screamed. There's a pack of them. Be careful. Yeah, yeah, I reassured her as she sat there with the car running, and the rest of them sitting inside, not sure what the heck was going on. I can't breathe, I told her. Just keep the car running. I need air, I clarified. I was not immediately afraid of being eaten by a pack of dogs. I knew I could get back in the car if they returned, but I was thinking that they disappeared into the woods, startled by the car. I stumbled over to the animal to look at it. It was dead all right, but the question was, for how long? Because this thing appeared to have been rotting for months. It was a ragged mess. It had matted, patchy fur and was bony. But with all that, it still looked like a predator nonetheless. It was all teeth and claws. It did not move as I was content to leave it to the scavengers. I stumbled back to the car. Elsie put it in gear and jerked us to an entirely awkward getaway. Unfortunately, we did not get a hundred feet before Britt started screaming for Elsie to stop. Elsie stopped much more smoothly this time at the side of the road. That was when I heard the growling, but the growling was not coming from outside. It was my stomach, and that was when I looked up to see Britt already out of the car tripping over Ralph. So there we were, the three of us, about 50 feet deep into the woods, puking our guts out. At one point, I looked over to see Britt quivering against a tree. Then, finally, I catch that of Ralph. Poor Ralph, he was lying face down in the leaves. It was sad. Frankly, at that time, I think if the werewolf had shown up, we would have been happy to volunteer for its dinner. Just kill us and end this suffering, I thought, until it actually happened. Seriously. I don't exactly remember when, but sometime during that hellish experience, I realized I was staring at a massive dog, at least seven feet tall. It was shaggy, furry, with angry eyes, and a face full of fangs. I stumbled up and called to my friend, Britt then gasped for Ralph to look. Right about that time, the thing snarled, and I swear the rattle coming off that thing's lungs was enough to turn your hair white. We had found the dog man, or should I say it found us, and accidentally or not, we were defenseless. I heard Britt gasp when she saw the thing. I heard Ralph cry. It was the disturbing cry of a grown man reverting into a child. I was scared and physically impaired but adrenaline has a way of overriding things in a situation like that. I bolted, then stopped and returned to grab the hand of Britt. We both fell. Then Ralph came tripping over and fell right behind us. I pushed them toward the car and yelled go. My two friends took off, and I threw a nearby fallen branch at the creature. The monster did not even move as it struck him. I turned to my fellow friends, running toward the car but I saw they had already been cut off by an infinite team of wild dogs. Then the thing behind me began howling again. 
It was so big and angry. I could feel its hot breath on my neck. I shook like a jelly stick as I turned around to face it. And as I stood there looking into the devil's eyes, I could hear the random wild canine at my back begin to growl at my friend. We were going to die here. It was hard for me to look into the face of the thing, especially as it drew close. It had a mouth that could rip a torso in half and a temperament for the task. I remember trying to breathe. I took a really deep, hard breath. Then the thing opened its giant mouth with the long, thick, powerful snout and leaned toward me with these long, muscular, human-like arms. I could smell its horrible, doggy breath. There was a low, increasingly loud growl. Then it lurched at me. I felt its teeth snap at my nose. Then I heard a yelp and the dog man was gone. I stumbled back out of reflex to see a massive creature about a foot taller than the dog man and at least twice as wide. It looked like a gorilla, but with human features. It had knocked the dog man against a tree and completely on its ass. I looked over to see the dog man getting up angry. Yeah, dog man was pissed. Of course, at this point, I thought I was having a fever hallucination, but it was a shared illusion as my friends walked up on either side of me, beachless, watching the spectacle. The wild dog launched into the Sasquatch thing, and he swatted them away like a slow pitch with a fat bat. I will admit I was relieved. I did not know what this gorilla human thing was, but he obviously had bad blood with the dog man. Good for us. Time to exit. When I looked back, the coast was clear to the car. All the dogs had emptied out onto the Bigfoot, and even though Bigfoot had saved us, I was not going to bother to stop and thank him because Bigfoot did not seem like he was interested in my gratitude. The two great beasts squared off. Both screamed at each other. It was louder than the back end of a jet. Ralph and Britt bolted toward the car. I started to run, but be hypnotized by the spectacle. How many people will see this in their life, I wondered. Dogman was faster. Dogman had a longer reach, but it did not seem to matter. Bigfoot seemed a hundred times stronger. I watched Bigfoot punch Dogman so hard that the Dogman cracked a sizable tree he impacted, but Dogman brushed it off like a sneeze. Then Dogman threw a flurry on Bigfoot that appeared to scratch the heck out of his face, partially his right eye, but it still did not stop the Bigfoot from dropping thundering punches into the dogman's chest, strong enough to snap a full-grown tulip tree. But instead of flying backward this time, the dogman grabbed onto Bigfoot and pulled him closer to the massive animal and wrapped his arms and legs around it, then scissored its jaws around Bigfoot's face. I wanted to help Bigfoot because, after all, Bigfoot had saved us, and it certainly looked like the dogman would crack Bigfoot's face like a walnut now. Then... Bigfoot sliced his giant arm up and over, thrusting it down on the dogman's head and prying dogman off its own body like a pancake from oiled Teflon. The giant canine fell off of Bigfoot's body like dry postage stamp off an antique letter. Dogman stumbled back, hit the ground, and bounced back up, snapping and spitting. Bigfoot returned the pleasantries as if to say, I could do this all day. I had no idea who was going to win between them, but it was then that the Bigfoot gave me a side glance, and that side glance told me that whomever would win the fight was not going to be good for me. To the victor go the spoils, and I may be the spoils. I left. I don't know who won that match. Maybe it was a brutal draw. I only know I would not want to be around to chat with the winner or loser. I thought afterward, that it was not really such a fantastic thing to believe. No more fantastic than a bear battling a lion. So, what is so strange about it? That the species are not yet identified? Well, considering how remote the area is, maybe not so unbelievable. Two stealth predators going at it. Their hatred for each other was stronger than their interest in us. Perhaps because they did not see us as a threat, considering how intelligent they appeared, and how secretive their domain, I can see why. After returning to the car, 
and the hysteric and unsure driving, the physical sickness began to return after the adrenaline wore off. Elfie was confused by her rambling and did not help that Ralph just kept repeating, Did you see that? Over and over. We made it to some place called Munising Memorial Hospital and were treated, I guess you could call it, for food poisoning. We would survive. And after all that, when we finally arrived at Jennifer's mother's house to drop her off that morning, she had the nerve to say, I think I might have pneumonia, as if any of you even care. I almost died because you people left me in the car, just so you can make up your stupid monster stories. We all sat silent as she rambled. Even Elfie refused to walk her to the door. Fiction, she shouted at us. Fiction. Again, she screamed as she slammed the car door. You people are living in a fantasy land. Pathetic liars, losers, were her final words to us as I drove away. Britt, Ralph, and I were still groggy, but thankfully not as bad off as the affliction that Jennifer possessed. I hope she gets her head right, but then again, she swims in a sea of like fish, so I really don't care as long as she stays away from us. Still, I guess we need to thank her because, for whatever reason, fate made us turn around that night. And that was good, because I do not believe that the dinner posse was rushing to get home from Salmonella, nor were they coincidentally peeling out to get to their respective homes to watch TV. There was something else going on there, something bad, something that Jennifer's drama led us away from. It was a crazy-ass ride. You don't believe me? Yeah, okay, that's cool. I would not believe me either. But the two animals we saw do exist. And someday, when it is proven, it will not even be remarkable enough for a mention on a National Geographic special. But for now, wow. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!